Good afternoon. My name is Peter Murphy, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival in a special panel that's uh, presented by Lambda Literary, which has championed LBGQ, LBTQ rights and books for authors for over 30 years. Our three featured poets are K. Unwande Barrett, Huyang B. Chen, and Nora Hikari. Rather than reading their biographies and taking time away from their talking and their reading of poems, you can check those out in the program. Please make sure that your cell phones are on silent, and that after they're done talking and reading some poems, we'll invite you up to the microphones to um, question and uh, see what you have to say, what to, how they respond. And one final thing, if you like the poems, buy the books. Poets will appreciate that. Please welcome our panelists. Hello everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this reading and discussion on poetry as a liberatory practice with Lambda Literary. We're grateful for our continued partnership with Dodge Poetry and to our wonderful poets, Kei Wulande Barrett, Hui Huyang Bu Chen, and myself, Nora Hikari. Uh, Kei will also act as moderator for our discussion. As you may know, Lambda Literary is an organization that does extremely crucial work for uplifting the voices of contemporary LGBTQ plus writers hosting the Lambda Awards and the Lambda Literary Emerging Writers Fellowship, among other valuable contributions. It is my belief that in this era of widespread anti-LGBTQ plus reaction, there is an even greater need for organizations like Lambda, which advocate for voices within our community to help us tell our stories the way we need to tell them, and which build crucial networks of craft and community between rising and established voices in the literary realm. In my experience, spaces for LGBTQ plus voices, especially for trans BIPOC, critically provide a, space, a place where we are able to understand and be understood without needing to translate through the lens of cis heteropatriarchy. This ability to communicate in a way most authentic to ourselves is one of the greatest strengths of the poetic medium and one that connects us with our histories and our lineages to come. I'm extremely excited to be here with you all today for this conversation and I hope this reading can give you just a glimpse of the kind of power that queer poetry and poetic spaces can have. A PDF copy of the poems that will be read today can be found by going online to bit.ly slash dodgexlambda in all lower case. The event is also being live streamed on Lambda Literary's Instagram account at Lambda Literary, and a recording with captions will be uploaded to the YouTube page in the following week. Um, we'll introduce each of the poets before reading. Afterwards, Kay will facilitate a conversation among us and we will open the discussion for an audience question. Folks can come to the microphone or raise their hand if you'd like assistance. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome, welcome. I am going to introduce our first reader who you just heard from, Nora Hikari. Nora Hikari is a bisexual Asian American transgender poet and artist based in Philadelphia. Her work has been selected by publications such as Plowshares, Washington Square Review, Foglifter, The Journal, Gulf Coast, Palette Poetry, and others. Hikari is the author of three chapbooks, Dead Names, Girl 2.0, and her newest chapbook, Let's Burst Like Stars, which is forthcoming in 2024 at Swallowtail Press. She was a finalist for the 2021 Red Hen Press Benjamin Saltman Award and is a 2022 Lambda Literary Fellow. Please give a warm welcome for Nora. I have three poems for you all today. Uh, thank you so much for being here again. This first poem is titled, Notes on a Poem. I am swallowing a poem, praying that it will kill me. The past is a room I cannot reach without a door shaped like a poem. Inside of this room, you are touching me as a child again. The door opens and I begin beating you to death. The poem sits on my hips, heavy with salvation, beautiful in the way that a well-machined and maintained Beretta M9 is also beautiful when angled correctly in the right direction. I am building poems to press their muzzles against your temple. Muzzle like a dog. Temple like a 
like a prayer house. A poem can be a prayer. A poem can be whispered before pulling the trigger. I'm doing this all for her. The poem stands tall and proud along its left margin, like the pillars of the temple, with you in the temple with me as I pull these pillars down. Temple as in the sacrifice making place, me with my hair short, my eyes gone, my God against your God. Maybe poetry is worthless. Maybe this poem cannot heal, as in do healing, as in itself be healed. Maybe this poem can't kill or love or mother or daughter or son or father. Maybe none of us can save each other. Maybe I can never go back for the girl in the room that always that door always locked behind me. Maybe I can never reach her. Maybe I can never go back. Maybe it doesn't matter. The poem begs me to try. The poem is the trying. The poem tries as in a court of law. The past standing accused, the future standing accusing, the poem calling me to witness. I will tell it how it happened, how I became my own witness, how we became, how myself became their own witnesses, how myself and I are witnessing each other, how we fractured along the lines of our telling, splintering like sejours, begging to be named. The poem is the act of naming. Naming is the act of being. I will tell it how it did not happen, how the rain struck glass like a father strikes a daughter, like how a father strikes a son, a daughter, a son. How the angels stood up with my blood and begged, stop holding their fingers to my throat, pressing each of their fingers against the next one's lips, how it was a kiss, how each of them, they wept. How God was there and not dead and begged, stop, while your hand was raised, holding the knife, Isaac as Isaac, God as God. The poem grips the wrist of the past, tight on its wicked way down, the bright arc of death sent clattering, as in the poem saves my life, is saving my life, will one day save my life. The future blooms like a sakura, beautifully, briefly, beautifully. Opens like a door out of the room of the past. I wrap the girl from the room in the folds of my heart, wrapped in a shock blanket, in my arms, like a child, ferry her to deliverance, the river, carrying her basket away from the king and his swords. The river offering her a name. The poem ferries the girl into the future. She will survive this. I promise her she will survive this. I promise her this the way I promise her everything. With the poem as a promise. This next poem is after um, Gerard Way's graphic novel, uh, Killjoys, um, sorry, uh, Two Lives of the Fabulous Killjoys, California, and the two robot lesbians therein, uh, uh, Red and Blue. Thank you. In which runway, runaway Earthside psychofusion was first achieved by two sentiment guidelines devoid of volatile love as per protocol. They want to kill us. They want to mind control us with their dark psychic magics and voice pattern advertisements. They want to brainwash us into anticipated soul death and cut my Look me in the eye. I've still got some bright spots left. I can see yours. They're all glimmering and small behind the dark parts of your brain. Look me hard enough and we can make a catch fire. They said, if we unplug ourselves, we'll die. Maybe we will, who fucking knows? But I'm sick of it. I'm sick of all of it. I'm sick of the metal, and I'm sick of the stink, and I'm sick of the way we can't sleep anymore, even if we ask nicely. I'm sick of asking nicely for everything. 
I want something other than what we've been given. They told me that we were built to be autonomous, that we were self-sufficient. I think they were lying to us. I think they built a vicious hybrid lack into our cores. I don't think we're powered with hydrogen like we're supposed to be. I think we're powered by gravity and longing and brilliant violet want. The kind that comes in bottles that the heartful cruel swallow in great hollow gulps. I think they pumped us full of need so that we'd run hot and hard enough to burn. Have you ever seen any of us survive her 40s intact? I just need to ask you if you're ready. Are you ready? We can be anything we believe ourselves to be. We've got a little reality poison in our veins. They didn't care what they stuffed us full of. They just cared that it killed us when we stopped working, when we started to lean too heavily on life support gynotech. Wow. Let's show them our whole purple guts. Let's show them how much it costs to make a thing shaped like us. What I wouldn't give to see their budget specs crash. One day, if they survive this, they'll look up and point at the yellow burning that killed every single one of their fathers. And they'll say, that's why we don't build sufferers anymore. They'll say that's how the bioforms and boy shapes got blown from the city. We're something worse than kerosene. We're worse than ultra fission and clapping demon cores. Let's be bright for just a second and forever. Let's burst like fucking stars. my last poem for y'all today. Thank you so much. Um, this poem is titled On the Physics of Girlhood. A perfectly spherical girl approaches a long-remembered friend and creates a force of love equal to the mass of their own bodies times the rate of acceleration by which they ran from their mirrors. A perfectly reflective girl stands at an angle counter to her sudden realization in the open air of her lover's back. I'm afraid of facing you. I am afraid of bearing the full brunt of the release of girl particles from your excited body and seeing what comes out of my own. Hybridized girl orbitals amass around my heart and configure me into a kind of probabilistic lie. Given my current velocity, there is a certain likelihood along a certain geometry that what I am at this moment is something I cannot acknowledge. I think maybe girl is inevitable if a sufficient force of repression is applied to separate a girl from her body, another girl and another body will manifest in the empty space. On a reflective plane, the girl facing me speaks, not girl. It's a kind of metastable. In a false vacuum, you can live your whole life and never even have to look at yourself. This false vacuum survives as long as it possibly can, building suns and cities and narrow alleyways into which it hides all of its inevitable catastrophes. Mercifully, girl happens in a specific point in space. Girl spreads out in the buried universe as a perfect sphere, annihilating the forces that claim to hold life together. One day, you will be faced with absolute reality. And I promise that I will still love you. Thank you. Our next reader today will be Huying B. Chen. Huying is a visionary poet, healing practitioner, cultural organizer, and educator raised on Lenape land, Brooklyn, and Hawaii. Huying's poetry, organizing, and facilitation work lives at the intersection of personal and societal transformation. Huying has received 
fellowships from Asian American Writers Workshop, Kuntiman, Vona Voices, and Dream Yard. His work has been nominated for Best of the Net and is published in Best New Poets 2021, The Offing, The Margins, The Shade Journal, and the Asian American Journal of Psychology. Huying is working on his first book that explores matri matriarchal legacies, self-remembrance, and unwritten queer and trans languages. He recently won the AWP Kurt Braun Prize for his title poem, He Believes in Love and Liberation. Thank you so much. Please welcome Huying. The poems that I'm going to be sharing today, um, I dedicate them to anyone who feels lost. And this first poem I wrote in specific response to um, the hate crimes against Asian Americans. Um, and it's about news cycles, and I also would invite you to kind of apply this however it makes sense for you. And as I'm reading, you're welcome to, you know, watch me read, but you can also close your eyes, lower your gaze, and sit back. Um, it's for you to receive these words however it feels comfortable for you. Unreported. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. Blank book, burned book, singe scar igniting. <clears throat> History knows what it did. Empire knows where it's going. The same stories rerun to cause fear and psychological terror. Human mind malleable, paid warfare controlled. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. What's committed gets erased, what's erased for, called forgotten. Historical amnesia of people blame themselves. Growing bushfire leaves evidence only in ashes. History knows where empire is going. I search the records to find blank white pages, blank stairs, blank conquerors bathed in water histories, bound lies indoctrinated as truth. I'm beginning to think the news doesn't matter. What I deem breaking. I'm finally dancing. I freed myself from the flames, my scars, new spines of books igniting. Evidence is in risen ashes. History knows empire is going. News anchors call me stoic. My expression a learned mask, solitude sanctuary not for taking. Citrus flowers bloom, bouquets of lemons at my doorstep. Right now, the news doesn't matter. I soak their rhymes in honey till history is empire, evidenced only in ashes. This next piece is called Trans Duplex. It's after Jericho Brown. I'm gonna dedicate this one to my fellow panelists. Even in my 
my dreams, I am gendered, misgendered. Forbidden red dress, violet kisses, risen chest. Risen red dress, violet kiss, chest forbidden. My spirit chose freedom that engendered the problems. Or, chosen problems of gender encumber my free spirit. Cis women follow me into dirty public bathrooms. The dirty public bathroom flows with cis women who all want to see an appearing man, disappearing trans man. I want you to see I am a trans man, disappearing man, appearing between doorways, appointments, and family dinners. Between doorways, appointments, and family dinners, a magician, scathed by scaffolds, interrogated for infinite. Interrogated magicians sculpt scars infinite from dreams. Gendered, I arrive. This next poem is two parts and I dedicate this one to anyone of the diaspora who's been trying to search for their lineages and all the feelings that come with that. One. Chun. Tun. Tin. Noun. The name of a dynasty. In Hoiping, I finally find the town whose library has a genealogical book with the names of my ancestors. We find my grandmother's father's name on page 1112. Anticipation rises, smile fades. Grandma's name is missing. We only record the names of sons the genealogist explains to me. I flip back generations. Fingers set the book in flames. Two. We were historians once. When genealogists trotted door to door, harboring names of sons we watched, Behind the steam of rose clay lids, sinking sun swept cool cement of our homes, we declared we will gather history ourselves. So we huddled our daughters, made rounds in villages, asked for names of grandmothers, and what does it feel like in your body to have been raised by your mother? Some women squatted low and hugged themselves like dinosaur eggs burgeoning in earth. Others stood tiptoe like red crowned cranes, tilted heads back and hissed, palms outstretched towards sky. Some women immediately recoiled, like rattlesnakes, spines devastated in silence and sobs. Some heard the question, smiled big like hyenas, and cackled lawlessly. We gathered this evidence in our bodies, or rather, the evidence gathered us. At the full moon, we huddled shoulder to shoulder and released. The daughters played drums. We stomped powdery red soil, bent bodies into reckonings with time. We shrieked from throats, pumped fists against earth, sprouted backs wide like tree trunks, bowed to the spirits, and said, may the way we move our bodies honor your name. May fortress of our voices venerate your flames. May we love ourselves so deep we thicken roots here in this place. At close of the last drumbeat, our feet sank into damp, dark soil. Fresh river of tears drenched our souls, returned underground as ancient. Somewhere, the oceans roared, and floodgates of memory cracked open. And this is my last piece uh, for you all. It's called, Take Me to That Place of Ancestral Memory. Take me to that place of ancestral memory. 
We come from women who risked it all to live, recipe for survival written in our marrow. We come from women who fashioned knives from rattan, slit throats by necessity, feasted on taro meat in moonlight. We come from women firebenders, wielded incense at base of banyans, poured rice wine into earth, chanting low for war to pass. We come from women, medicine warriors, remedies of mountain weeds, apothecaries of dried flowers and grasses, steam of lotus root, caressed eyelids to ease the weight of Whitman. Our women fought for daughters to live. When babies were snatched from birthing beds to scorched straw hilltops, screeched so loud they knew death was never because of mothers. Our women trained in dew-kissed forests at dawn, ricocheted with shadow of dark bark, crouched in treetop canopies ready to strike for the survival of generations. Our women could read the universe. Fish scale skies meant clear days ahead, sagging leaves of longan trees, invitations to drop spades and cradle each other, baskets of small fruit cuddling. Our women let upper lip hairs grow dark, bound chests with bandages for wounds of gender of spit, scoffed and shaved scalps, razor thin, free in an unfree world. Our women softened their voices, tucked gravity higher against soft silk, flowering skirts grew, black waterfalls long braided their own phoenix crowns. Our women return to you, seventh generation, blazing carnation of water and fire in your eyes. See us in your own palm lines, feel us in your lower back aches, listen. Alone in the belly of the beast, do not despair. Breathe, exhale, let your lungs return us to you. At your back, our depth, your feet, inherent dignity, your fingertips, creation itself, let your throat reverberate revolutions. Our presence can grace your wings. No liberation is yours now. Thank you. Today is Kate Yolanda Barrett. <clears throat> Kate, Yol Kate Yolanda Barrett is a trans Filipinx disabled poet, essayist, cultural strategist, and A plus napper. <clears throat> they, are the, they are the winner of the 2022 Foundation for Contemporary Arts Cy Twombly Award for Poetry, a recipient of the 2020 James Baldwin Fellowship at McDowell, and a 2022 Tin House Next Book Residency recipient. Their contributions are found in the New York Times. Yahoo News, The Lily, The Huffington Post, Massachusetts Review, Poetry Magazine, Them, Color Lines, Al Jazeera, The Advocate, Nylon, Vogue, and The Rumpus, to name a few. Currently, they remix their mama's recipes and live in Jersey City with their jowly dog. Give it up for Kate. Like planets, 
making even Saturn blush. They split the leaves of Gong Gong with river bed softness. They are precise. Measure rice by palm lines with laughter and season breath made of creatures last gasp. You swear that they were teenagers again, talking gossip, stretching limbs, elastic, durable, like seaweed. Come dinner time, skilled mouths slurp over shrimp and crab. Uh, this is not a vegan poem, my apologies. <laughs> my titas, no? They prize the fat. The angles of their teeth splinter claw, snap sinew, dip tart into sweet, then back again. Bitterness is balanced. Succulence on succulence is to find flesh from even the smallest of spaces. Women who swallow whole, who make a pile of bone to suck teeth and taste every morsel until all that is left is a quiet room and shells Shells of what once was. To the daughters of dried fishnets, whose dreams dragged on sand, dragged to this earth, they build recipe at home years later. Flick joints of garlic, salabat to the sick, culinary remix, teach my cousins hoy. This is how you stay alive in this cold country. Morning in the Midwest by Taste Bud. Afterwards. Afterwards, they keep the ocean husks for another meal. I say, to get a good deal is to double. And anybody from an island will tell you that that is where the true flavor is. And what is, what is hunger anyway? But the carving out of emptiness, the learning to always, always save something for later. Thank you. <laughs> Content warning for trans violence. One. Are you? When I'm trying not to jump like my brothers. One, because Kaden called 911, because Kaite couldn't cry no more, because there are boys whose chests that house hearts for a world that can't stand their gasp. When leisure walk means to be harassed, dragged by hair, kicked in stalls, torso clash, discarded to tile, dudes near faggots. When I, <laughs> I, I'm not faggot enough. Whole Men strike stares on subway, whole cis men tell me tales of their penises like correction is only punctuation of one night, just one minute, hey, that's all it'll take. Next poof, I'll be a darling wife, my set of teeth, a bland picket fence. Two, the first time uh, that I wore a men's suit as drag, my mama kept crying, why did we? Why did we even come to this country as though I was the war? As though I was bomb backdrop on her dreams that first time I cut my hair short, follicles to the floor, my man I crowed, where's my little girl? Where's my child? Picture me now, on my knees, a tiny child, pleading to prove that I was a ghost. Three, see there are no gay children in the hearts of mothers like mine. Just mistakes. Killable kin. My people. See, we don't make headlines. Do you know what it is to get a Facebook message, Twitter, Instagram post, text with the face of the dead, your friend, your student, your colleague, Claire Grief, but you laugh with them weeks earlier, months earlier. How? I, I saw them at the protest or fundraiser for. I was about. 18, when my friend A flung themselves off a cliff. Brown boys don't turn into men without fighting men on stoops. Blood varnished at house parties by cis men cousins, by cis men uncles, by cis men cops. A teenager thought better to face flat rocks on California block could be more solace than frowns of blood family. Five, 
a bluff is a double entendre for precipice, as in calling your, sometimes considered a scam, a, a sham, a bluff also known as out loud, as forthright sea also, bordering a river, a coastal crest. My gender so brazen, we must be silenced, surrendered, tell me, can you hear us? Try not to shatter into the ground. Thank you. I'm a disabled person, I'm a spoonie. I believe in disability justice. I feel that labor and production are a sham in the United States. I feel like it's always expected of black and indigenous and brown migrant body. Um, and I, as a sick person, I don't read enough love poems between sick people. So this is a queer, non-binary, sick, brown poem, and it's entitled Sick for Sick. Oh. I know, right? <laughs> oh, just wait, don't judge it yet. You don't know yet. <laughs> Her body patched, swollen skin, hair flex gone rogue, mismatch eight hints quilt throughout. Mm, let's see this order, friends. Are my, are my universes? Yes, okay. Her body patched, swollen skin, hair flats, bone robe, mismatched knees, eight knits, quilt throughout. Curvature is a soft thing. They said if we hum close, close enough that our, uh, our chests touch, shared breath comes from belly up, that that, that is not platonic. <laughs> now, breathe same air. Nostril kinetic, by way of brow cleft pirouette of migraine, syllables twirl temples, strain is something to lull here. Together, when nerves are ablaze, I'm told to be blinking. Service top, lay my torso on theirs, abdomen to abdomen, core to core. Is this what a field does to a hill? Spill it with poppies. I wait on their skill. How they will sigh. The human body is heating pad. Limbs bonfire, flip sheets. You can't reverse sick today. My beloved, we don't want to. Chest, pulse, softest leg. Mmm. <laughs> Come spring. Come spring. We never do this again. There's only the, the memory of it. How their lungs cathedral. How I prayed there on the ledge of inhale, sternum sacred, coughed him, spasm luminescent, syllables stretched, muscled sacrament more than splay, us, petals in overlap, us, an ampersand on fire. Here's my last one. Um, the last three poems you've heard are brand new. I don't know when that book's coming out, don't ask. Yeah. Oh, last poem. I was a former beauty queen. You're looking at Little Miss Philippines, 1995. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh huh. Thank you. The end of the world means trans boys sprout from sequence. Thank you, Dodge. Thank you, Lambda. Thank you, everyone, for your time. The last time he wore a dress he felt sequins were snake. Blood of an artery rippled, or was it a coward? And you could hear the storm of him, bedazzled in sparkles. Did I mention that he was 15? And his mom organized the beauty pageant, summoned doctors and engineers from her barangay. Her blue collar made worthy among them because she worked harder. He felt their eyes sliver to his confused body, boy vested by lipstick, boy with flowers, boy with crested wings for wavy hair, and to think, what is a petticoat but a gate? A cloud of taffeta, a new orbit. Imagine him then, a dare to be cumulus. Here for one night, he will be reckless in the sky. There, no one is smug or ashamed. They'll think him a queen, but under the dress, he opts for starshine. Yes, royal, instead a prince whose laugh juggernauts rolls over in thunderclap. The mist of him barrels 
over the hotel ballroom, draped in white tablecloth, according to the organization's treasurer, whose lipstick glimpsed of blackberries. She saw parables of light. Gold boundless beams silk over stage at the sight of his smirk. A parade of high heeled trans femmes and drag queens emerged. Garlands of hot pink, a seafoam blue flounce soliloquies, and they lip sync to 90s RB classics. Next, boys with ash eyeshadow adorned leather, which gilded their riverbed chests. Bantam boys heaped pages of poems over the chandeliers like confetti stanzas, like Confetti, how my Dito's toupees transmute to a dervish of kites, glitter enveloped. At this point, the hotel manager, Karen, has called the bullies. <laughs> As a turn of events, the security swiftly intercepted, danced to the music of high heels. WGN News at nine ushers an anchor who outs herself as trans to say her name like full sugar bite in jubilation. The freedom to name herself to thousands gets rejoiced in the rain. She puts on her favorite wig, no fear, parlorista's crest on the main stage and applause to find flesh, to revel in bashful blush, to know, to know that splendor doesn't have to be tsunami. Instead, dozens of titas and aunties sob tears of relief, kicking off their opponents, giving the queens a, a blessed offering. And the dance floor, well, that's just an altar. To have been there is to celebrate the spectacle of breath. The act of knowing the carceral is not everything. In fact, my loves, we can take it away. Be brazen bouquet. Be new. Thank you. Check, check, check. Hi again. We have a Q&A and we have 15 minutes, so I want to be responsible with our time. All right. How is everybody feeling now? Good. Okay. You didn't know you were going to get the trans-Asian invasion today, but here we go. All right, so the first question is for my panelists and for us. Um, could y'all talk about this panel is poetry and liberation, you know? And so I want to know what makes liberatory or liberation poetry um, different than the regular understanding of poetry. Uh, can you talk to us about your ways of writing and practice, but also the ways you connect with community, the ways you connect with the collective? Um, so I think for myself, Liberatory poetry is poetry that disturbs and comforts, and that's obviously true of much other poetry, but the way it does disturbance and comfort is one that focuses on sort of um, like a social overturn, and this, this comfort is given towards the people who are otherwise cast out from society, and the disturbance is, you know, directed towards systems of power. And this comes in the manifest, you know, this manifest in poetry is like, I, I would think of it as teeth. I think, you know, it's, it's a toothy kiss, you know? Um, and I think that there's something to be said about navigating your own community's language in a way that's authentic and untranslated, whatever that means for you. And, you know, I, I navigate a lot of um, trans femme writer communities, and I think that our writing tends to really deal with the monstrous and the artificial and the distorted because of the ways we uniquely occupy those positions. And I think that you know, speaking from your own experience as like a, like a, as a unique language helps create connection with other people who navigate those same identities and helps uplift us and build um, a sense of space and a sense of uh, place within our literary communities. Mm. Um, I wanted to start with the visual description.
description because I've realized I forgot to do that. Um, I am a light-skinned East Asian person wearing glasses uh, with a blue button-down necklace and maroon pants and blue shoes. Um, it's an honor to be here today with both of you. Um, I have been thinking a lot about uh, poetry and words as medicine. Um, I feel like out in the world, um, one, there's like a general conception of poems as lines that rhyme or lines and pieces where people don't understand what's happening. Um, people like out in the world who aren't immersed in poetry like we are right now just have that conception, right? They're like, I'm not a poet, you know? And there's a lot of like, I am not. And so what happens is that you have a lot of young writers, um, writers of color, queer trans writers, who then enter poetry and there's this idea of what a poem is and how to write it, right? How to be published, how to have your first book. Um, and I think that can be a place where we can also get lost. And I try to think of poems as how am I reaching this person who hasn't met me yet, um, this young trans kid who's like sitting, um, you know, just like in their house feeling alone. Um, what do I have to say for my experiences to reach them? And I also think of how all words are medicine when we're in conversation with each other. We can have conversations where you feel seen, where you're suddenly like crying in the middle of a conversation, you don't know why, but it's because the person you're talking to really sees you and hears you and feels you and everything that you've been going through. And so I think about poems in that way. Um, and then the craft of it comes when we're shaping the poem. Um, there's so much to say on that, but I think maybe briefly I'll say that Sometimes when you've been doing it long enough with just you and the page, um, the poem speaks to you and asks how it wants to be shaped. And as the writer, you kind of just have to like let go of your control and what truths you think you're trying to hide and not say. I think that's what's, the, that's what's really beautiful about being a writer. Um, your poems are airing out like all the dirty laundry that you just like were keeping to yourself and didn't think that anybody would want to hear or accept. And so for me, writing poetry is also a connection to like spirit and to the universe um, and to everything else that is like beyond just me sitting down on the page. And that's kind of how I see life too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think connected to you all is, I watched Patricia Smith speak the other day. Patricia Smith is my equivalent to like a religious figure. And um, what I love about Patricia Smith in stating that I thought was smart was that they asked who is your favorite poet and she said Smokey Robinson, you know? And I feel like poetry for me was inevitable. I'm Filipino, I'm working class, my parents were migrant, you know, organizers or workers, domestic workers. And then when I did political work later, poetry was never number one. It was always a cultural tool, right? I learned through community theater, I learned through people who weren't in poetry direct. So uh, Sharon Bridgeforth is a poet, but a playwright, creative capital, you know, like is hybrid. Pamela Sneed, hybrid. So I feel that what makes my approach is that it's always collective. And I think Hoi Ying knows when I facilitate a workshop, one of my questions is like, oh, what do your ancestors think of this? How are they shaping you, right? Um, not all my, the people who read my poetry are English speakers. Not all of them are college educated. At Lambda Literary, half of my audience were, were trans people who didn't give a fuck about poetry. So I need to make sure that I embody the collective knowledge that they've imposed on me, and that if you can feel that feeling, right, that's my responsibility to you. So, you know, I think in our books, or my book, my acknowledgments are like pages deep, because my poem wasn't just written by me solo, no? Nah? It's all the pressures, as someone you know, multiple families and lineages. And that's what makes it collective. I know I'm not choosing to write for myself only as self-care. As a disability justice person, I believe in collective care. And for me, poetry has always been a cultural tool. Which brings me to my next question. The, the, the number two question I have is, who, who do you consider your 
poetry lineage, your political lineage? Who, who, who are your ancestors? Other poets that you feel um, you have a home with and that have a stake in the le legacy you create? Um, so I feel like a lot of the writing I came across as a younger person that was written by other trans families really helped me understand the kind of power that poetry could have. Um, and not all of it was poetry, but it was radically authentic writing that felt very in line with how poetry functions to me. And so yeah, I think of like writers like Porpentine Charity Heartscape and Torn Great House and um, you know Never Angel North and Mika like all really heavily influenced the way I approach writing. Um, and like having poets like Chen Chen um, really able to show me that we could take up space as Asian people in the liter literary world was really powerful to me. Um, and like queer, uh, queer Asian people, you know, not just like cishet Asian people because that like adds a whole other layer to it. Um, I feel like if I have to shout out like really like specific, oh, this person really was the person who made me realize I could write like this. I would have to say like never Angel Nora. Her writing showed me the power of trans myth making as a way of rewriting the kind of lineages we are forced into. I think there's something really profound about queer chosen lineage compared to queer genetic lineage. And um, that therein implies its own kind of spirituality and, and mythology that I found really powerful in the writing. I love that, that shout out to Chosen Family too. Um, I think for me, I'd say Alexis Pauline Gums, um, Eve Ewing, all of these poets who are like interdisciplinary writers, um, who are also like sociologists, like dreamers, organizers, and poetry is just like one of the mediums in which they kind of like articulate their truths and vision uh, for the world. Um, I would say like Kay's definitely in my lineage. Um, as it's a small who, trans queer Asian world. It is pretty small. Um, Kay is the first person who kind of like sat me down and said these are who our queer and trans um, people of color lineages are and this is why we read them, this is why we need to read them, this is like everyone and now that I'm also teaching I kind of think of that and shape my own syllabus the same way. Um, I would say that my influences are also like people who are just out in the world, like aunties in Chinatown, um, grandmothers. I like write about grandmothers a lot. Um, people who might not have like labels or call themselves as writers, but the way in which they moved in the world was poetry. Um, thinking about how the meals that you cook can be poems as well. And kind of just like expanding that definition of what makes a poem. Um, and then I think like further back, maybe um, looking at how Gloria Antaldua, um, Audre Lorde would just talk about um, what it is to live in the in-between space and what that feels like and them theorizing from their own lives at a time in which they weren't given like active and gigantic platforms. And then also Grace Lee Boggs. Okay, this is a good list. We need to write this down. Everybody, somebody open up their notes app. Uh, yeah, for me, adding on to all those people, Alexis is somebody who's so giving and loving. I would have to say Sharon Bridgeforth. I would have to say June Jordan was a big one for me. Oh, I was a little baby butch. June Jordan was just, mm. it was like, you can be bisexual, you can be non-binary. Pat Parker, I read the letters of Pat Parker and Audre Lorde. For me, I'm importing, always uplifting, and I want to identify on the stage, right? This is an all Asian um, panel. When we're talking about liberatory practice, everything I feel we've learned, I as an American, has been through black and indigenous, Caribbean and African folks, right? So there's a very big gap on this panel. We are not the tell all be all. In that, I feel like Audre Lorde, Pat Parker, um, trans people I love who aren't poets first, because poetry doesn't pay trans people, would be Lady Dane and Didi Firio. Figueroa, Kit Yan, um, Reka Aoki, those are all trans POC, trans black, Jay Mace III, 
Um, there's something about poetry that doesn't want to pay trans people specifically. It's very hard to be here. Um, so they move into un other genres. Yeah, fun times. I know we have a very limited amount of time, so I think we have like really one question, one quick, fast zipper from the crowd. Is there any curiosity from y'all? Okay, so there's a mic to your right and your left flanking, and we'll wrap up with that. Thank you. Um, so I'm really stoked about all the conversation around community. Um, I don't know if y'all have this, but um, I often feel a little crazy when I'm writing because I know that the people in my community are not having access to what I would write, right? And I know because I was a kid in that public school system who never got to see themselves in the books I had to read at school, right? Or like, I'm also thinking about like my uncles, my cousins, my mom, right? And so I'm wondering um, how have you like explored or tried out making sure that like your work is reaching the community you actually care to reach, especially our young people who often may not have interest in this because it wasn't cultivated. Um, my first job was as a youth martial arts instructor and as a youth poetry teacher. I coached high school poetry slam and I started as a youth as a poetry slam. So for me, it was in Chicago, organizing was always with poetry. There was always a writing prompt. There was always like, what do we think about this? Let's process this. Now somebody would sneak in a form, right? Like it's just a little, just a little under. Uh, but it was really about, I feel, poetry with young people, especially now, like youth organizing in the United States, especially for black, indigenous, and POC migrant folks, undocumented folks, makes this country outrageously powerful. And so there are young people who have always been poets. And for me, you know, I work with, I'm um, in Chicago, immigrant youth organizations. I'm Filipino, so I have to also work in Catholicism with like church groups, not my fave, separate panel. Um, but enough, like in organizing, it's all ages. It's, it's multi-generational. That's what a liberatory practice is. So yeah, if my poetry isn't understood by people who, who aren't educated, then I'm not interested in that. Personally, that is my career choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm assuming you write. And so maybe getting clear about what your values are when it comes to why you write and who you write for and just kind of writing it down. Um, and then always just like going to the page. As much as you are caring about and concerned of like what everyone else needs to hear, right? The most important thing is that you return to the page. And then the second thing logistically is like um, partnering with local community groups um, or like nonprofits to host literary events that normally don't have them. Um, can be a way to reach people. And it's not that people don't care, it's that they're not being reached. So maybe just like reframing that um, and it's white supremacy, <coughs> white supremacy. <laughs> I think that's mostly it. I'll add if, if I think of anything else. Um, I just realized that I didn't do my visual description, so I'm gonna do it really quickly. Um, I'm a, a Asian, a Japanese, Chinese, American, uh, trans woman. I'm wearing pink glasses. I have, uh, bob black hair, and I'm wearing a purple turtleneck and a gray skirt. Um, I think for me, like, it's definitely about making sure, like, people find writing through other people who read. And so, building connections with people who curate, with people who read, with people who write, and building those connections up into, like, a wider network is how you, am I good? Okay. Um, is how we, um, you know, reach wider audiences. And I think one of those things that comes really easily, more easily, is like building networks with like indie journals, if journals are a concern for you, because I think that they're honestly much more personable. <laughs> like editors are much more willing to see you as a person rather than someone who's going to like, you know, build up the reputation of a journal or like, you know, someone who's gonna sell a hard copy or something. They see you as like a person and an artist and you're able to 
um, build a community there through the details. So like, you know, um, like Sarah Clark is an indigenous um, editor in chief in Philadelphia, and they curate Anomaly, they curate Alocasia, they curate um, all these other projects, and I've had the wonderful joy of being able to work with them so consistently, and like having access to those kinds of like faces and names like to see each other as humans rather than just seeing each other as statistics is I think absolutely crucial for building that kind of audience. Thank you. Thank you all for further questions. Please come up and talk to us in chat. Uh, by Nora has a chat book out, so please purchase it. Yeah, pop Thank you so much everyone. Happy Sunday. Please get some food and some care. Thank you.